what's going on in the way that we have a city unit. So happens that the growth industry is a place to deliver. And but in order to get a liquor license, you have to have a place where it's your food. So therefore, you know, you have to get to the foundation, if you will, which is the pressure. You know, because a lot of these bars and lounges or independent places where they're supposed to be in place of the rest. And it's, you know, it's, rather than making a gray area, gray area is difficult to enforce and so forth, you tend to go to the foundation and say, you know, any establishment and the list is there, the big shop, the restaurant, the bar, whatever, the place of assembly, which turn into this kind of big place. There's a lot of there's a lot of big properties in there. You know, which are not developed. Some are storage facilities, some are electric companies in Barbara. You know, there's a, there's a lot on the on, 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 on Austin. So the question is, what is the future of those places? And should they be guided in the majority of the business people and residents and the city, given that this is the time of liberty? Or should we make the Wild West and whatever happens, happens? You know, I'm afraid that the Wild West is not a very nice place to be. Um, because of the, uh, just the law. And that's not what we should be doing. That's not a sophisticated, intelligent, rational approach of having good urban public rights. So that's why the foundation of the rest is going on. But again, for one year, we will go for the four urban plan in 2004 and they officially decided not to act. And now it's deciding five years later, well, there's a problem because residents have complained. We're going to look at it. But unfortunately, the situation is already out of hand. So that's my first thing. The other thing earlier was that someone said, you know, what um, applications are up there already. And then someone mentioned the specific location or that there are entertainment and you weren't aware of it. How come the city's not aware of it? Like, what's the process of granting licenses, whether it's liquor licenses, bar licenses, and then not being aware? You should be very aware of what exists on the street. Don't they pay taxes? Well, there's 2.6 million people living in Toronto. But you're uh, wrong. We, 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 I don't know how many establishments there are. You know, these things are always evolving in the neighborhood. You don't want to, by the way, in 2004, the petition was made by the citizens' representatives in Austin, the residents' representatives brought it and so forth, and he told us, we don't want enough. So, I got the petition, you have to listen to your community. You know, like, I'm not a dictator here, but, you know, we ought to do that because in my opinion at that time, they should have been come up. And if the community is not going to want it, it was the community position. The city knows, you know, who has got a license, but we don't have thousands of inspectors there. We don't have an army, you know. How many people you have working in the city, you know? Well, across the old city of Toronto, we have 35 inspectors. And that's from Victoria Park to Parkside to the Lake, okay? But you need to not 
Love is that thing, and I think everybody's done so far the same way. So let's keep it that way, okay? Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, well, to begin with, the, the, the agenda residents, the streets are, you know, we're back to our guys, the residents of the streets, the the so therefore that still over our curve. Where they might occur, in theory, down the street, college, and so forth, uh, we don't have the same pressure, you know, in terms of, uh, they tend to be, they're more established streets where there's a history of uses in those streets. Where Austin has got a, an additional element, which is the industrial area. You see that, you know, carpentry, you know, there, electrical, and what have you, hardware, big, huge hardware stores, you know, uh, which is uh, transitioning to new uses. So therefore, it's not a, it's, it's not a mature street in that sense. That is the difference. So I, I live on the street Along by the beer store, there's a huge chemical in there. And it seems that this could force. It's going to change what's going on out there, but it seems that it could force that. It's not going to have to wait. I'm just wondering how you're going to deal with those kinds of problems. Well, it's not like this. You're not going to address these problems. You need to bring it to my attention. <laughs> Okay, 
to me, everybody has a right to be here, we're trying to solicit the people, we're just going to go to the process. So it's just very... <coughs> 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 I've been doing a preferential for content, except that if I had a problem, a noise problem, I could call a telephone number and an inspector would come to uh, my uh, premises at a particular time in the evening or night when I had my most severe problem with a little uh, measuring device that would measure the application of the noise in my cell. I haven't even done anything like this. Secondly, I don't understand how an establishment on Arlington that everyone knows that it is both residential and commercial can advertise to open to a AM. And thirdly is the issue of the patio. I understand as a community or as a, as a neighbor the kind of level of noise that the patio will project. However, if a patio is a, 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 an establishment is asking for a permit and we are told as a community that we have one here, it is a permit in which we can, as a community, evaluate the noise of the establishment. But the establishment, having created the, the, the patio, doesn't have any activity there for a year. So we as a community during that year cannot make any judgment on it. But the license is coming up. What is it as a community that we can actually do about it? Since there is a case in point, and I don't exactly know why, I mean, I've been told certain things, but I would like everyone else to do the, the way we enforce the planning districts from our colleagues in Montreal or Vancouver or other major urban centers in Canada, uh, our noise bylaw may be a little different. Our old noise bylaw used to have a particular measurement. So you're right, we stand there with a noise meter and measure from a certain distance how many decibels you were receiving from the source. So your point of reception and the source. However, the new, the new noise bylaw doesn't speak to measurement anymore. It says, in very simple language, if it's disturbing to you as an inhabitant of the city, then it's a violation. Of course, we have to establish how it's disturbing you. You know, for example, late night, you could be trying to go, go to sleep and you can't because the music is so loud. If you're watching TV and you've got to crank your volume up to the maximum just to hear it over whatever you're having to endure. Um, could you bring a book and you know, you're not, you can't concentrate. So there's provisions in the bylaw that address how it disturbs someone. There's also another provision in our noise bylaw that speaks to projecting beyond the law. And we're not telling anybody, including all of you here, that you can't turn on a radio or, you know, play some music while you're cleaning your house. But you should contain that music within your four building walls. <coughs> so there's, there's the same expectation of a licensed establishment that they want to play music, they can't play music inside, but it needs to be contained within the core building hall. So what we've been doing, not what we're going to do, what we've been doing the last few weeks along the College Street corridor, the Osmonton corridor, and the Queen Street West corridor, what's the building corridor over Queen, called my S, is we've been out on weekends, uh, Fridays and Saturdays, and we've been monitoring all of these places along here, all of the places on College, all of the places on Queen West, to determine if, one, if someone's called us, like yourself, we'll deal with that outside and, you know, send you a noise log and ask you to record the incident, and if we have to, we'll attend your residence. But otherwise, if my officers are traveling, they're listening for noise that's projecting beyond the lot line. So a lot of these places, choose to play their music really loud or crop open all their doors and windows so it spills out. A lot of those places that we know the violation act have been charged. And those charges are before the courts. And we'll continue to charge based on that 
as well as any other complaints we receive from yourself or anybody else. Uh, because you refer to a license, so we, we license people to use the city. Okay, the city licenses individuals who request to use the city boulevard, so city property, to have a patio. We have a lot of those on Polar Street, for example, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, or on Queen West as well. But if they're occupying um, city space for their patio, and they have permission to do so, if the patio is on a flanking street, for example, Argyle or Rodia, or any of the other streets, there is no amplifying sound permitted, period. So you can't have speakers, you can't have anything. And on top of that, the patio has to be cleared by 11 o'clock of everything. So, so the issue here primarily is enforcement. That there are establishments operating in ways that they don't particularly direct us. Oh, yeah, open a bar, they crack you up. Open a restaurant kind of turns into one. And now, if we actually could, we, you know, we have limited resources, I would say. So by the time this does get enforced, and these places decide to close up, if a lot of that happens during this year with the increased scrutiny, maybe the kinds of places we do want to have open, like an actual restaurant or a bakery, if this is in place, <laughs> then we could have this. And so one of the issues that has that sort of uh, effectiveness been clear, and what alternatives are part of it that you might not have that negative effect towards the point of trying to reduce these going places? Well, enforcement is very hard to do. That's why people get up. And often a lot of establishments don't mind getting the ticket because the cost of doing this. Okay? It's, 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 you know, my grandma used to say, now the prevention is worth a pound of fuel. The prevention is make sure that the layout with the sports class and the street is laid out before the line. So if you try to cure it that way, it's a pound of fuel. That's why, you know, the city has a Rather than think of any goals, then we it. You know, uh, you just, that's why it's a very good question, but that's the thing. I'll put it right now. Um, I've only been in the area for about three years. Um, but I honestly think this bylaw is terrible, um, which may seem shocking based on, I'm on Rebecca Street. Um, so I've got Tesco, and I've got the storage unit sandwiching me. Um, but I have to agree with the gentleman here that I think the major problem is that there's <coughs> absolutely terrible enforcement happening in the area. Um, I think probably the most of the reason why the residents are here um, is because of the amount of noise that's happening on the street, the lack of parking that's starting to happen, and in terms of not being able to find any parking anywhere near your house. Um, and it seems to me that most of the problems are coming from places that are actually breaking the existing bylaw. Um, I want to see more restaurants. I want to see diversity in the neighborhood. I like where the neighborhood has been going. Um, and I think it's a real shame that they're starting to become this antagonistic quality between the residents and the <coughs> demographic of owners of establishments. Because I think, I mean, I agree there should be bars. I think bars are great. I just think clearly this neighborhood shouldn't have the bars. I mean, there seems to be some problem where there's been these businesses that are brought in under the auspices of being something other than what they are, and, and they were allowed to come to the table. Now, I don't understand why they were allowed in the first place. I agree, I think there's some bars over here. Um, and that's, I don't think it's a war. Like, I don't want it to be a war because I think that's a terrible place to go. Um, but it's almost like they were allowed in, and now, and I sort of feel badly because it's, they've been established, and now they're being told that there's a major issue, which there is, and it's because they should have been allowed there in the first place. Um, and I don't understand, like, I do not understand, I think this file is terrible. So they have been killed. Where the storage is, where the electrical company is, that presently you can have to 4,000 square feet now. But that, that would be Johnson is lives on your street, and our historic has been conserved by your factory. So you think your lifestyle will be improved? No, I actually, I have. So do you a, want us to then to start checking? Like the the I have a bar behind me that stays open until 2 a.m. in the back patio. I know the noise seven days a week. Excuse me, can I just finish my idea? I know the noise seven days a week. It should not be happening. 
Second of all, that would be an entertainment facility, which as I understood, based on the McDonald's comments, shouldn't even be allowed in the neighborhood in the first place. So I don't, like, that's a non-issue. That's an irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Do you measure <laughs>
And the reason is that if you allow people to know that you're thinking about doing it, in fact, somebody tells me, I'm going to go rob a bank. And I'm not sure. 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 Open a day shop and then start to do it in a different way. Um, and they make a lot of noise with their music. It, it just keeps me up at night, and it's really hard to sleep, and then I just breathe until I'm caught. And they play, Thank you. Thank you.
know a very good city. We're trying to say this establishment to live here, you know, to fulfill the fire goal, of the house and so forth. Well, and that's actually my concern. Let me, let me, let me, I'm allowed to establish myself. No, because I, I think you've misinterpreted my question. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to lend to you. However, uh, you like to give full information, that way the rest of the people understand the process. It's all about the fair off. Now, what happens is that now I, as a councillor, who objects to a license, as a councillor, you know, I've got authority. You, any resident, can object. The City of Toronto Council does not normally object if it's permitted within the city zone bylaw that that establishment is legal and has the right to So the city will not be communicating with you on that because it's not the city that is coming. It's got the authority to give you the legal license to the HCO, the provincial authority, and they have their own system. So it's not the city. Okay. Only to point out at the conclusion of our meeting there, that he took a phone call. How can I get the results of your personal phone call? What phone call is that? It's with regards to an item, which or an establishment, which I don't like. Okay, sorry, I cannot address a particular case uh, because I don't know exactly what it's about. How do I get the results you want to talk to me for that uh, phone call? Because a lot of the residents didn't get that, didn't get a phone call from your office. So you want to talk about a particular property in a particular place or more than that? I am not bringing up the property. It's not being addressed. I don't know what I'm asking you. you. How do I get the results of your personal phone call? Sir, I don't know what you're talking about. My name is 25.18. I'm sorry? 25.18. It's a flying beach property. Which one is that? On Rolliot Street. Let me know that uh, the, the city of Toronto clerk, actually, not me, sent out a letter to the community, and the majority of the people who replied replied in favor of that cafe, which is the corner of the right to north, west corner of the Rodia, and Hospital. And, and based on the fact that the majority of the people replied it, I supported the application. Oh, I got the letter, the first letter. A second letter I never got. No, the, 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 but you technically, what happens in cities, whatever it does, uh, calling, it says, if you reach, if a certain percentage of the people who respond, you know, sometimes 60% of the people call that respond, right. and if the majority is in favor, then it's automatically given to them. If it's less than 60% of the people respond, even though the people who respond in three quarters are in favor, then, you know, it goes to community council or who. In my opinion, that is a technicality. And if the majority of people are in favor of it, I support it. Why not go to the process? Why, what's the uh, municipal licensing standards telling me I'm under that? That's my answer. Various forums, uh, both online interviews and in discussion in groups. A recurring theme that I keep hearing from uh, various groups of people, um, obviously not residents of kids, are people saying that, well, why are you having your kids downtown? Why are you having your kids? If you want to have quiet and you want to have your kids move out of the downtown, I'd like to address the people that are against having kids downtown. Because a lot of these complaints are, like my family is, is complaining about this issue because we've got a kid and we need to sleep at night and our child needs to sleep at night. And the noise, uh, the rowdy people coming off of Osington, drunk, puking on my stoop, puking on my stoop, smoking drugs on my stoop. Okay, well, a, bit, a bit of context. I work in the bar industry. Okay, I work for what uh, the people that own Watusi. Okay, it, it's a matter of the clientele that an establishment has, and whether or not the owners are respectful of the community, and if their clientele are made to respect the community. People keep, I keep hearing, well, don't have your kids downtown. If we didn't have kids downtown, there'd be no youth culture downtown. If there was no youth culture downtown, there would be no bar scene. There would be no art scene. The moratorium for a year makes sense because it makes everybody stop and think. Okay, do I want to put all the money into a location on Osington to try and open up a big club? Because it's going to get shut down. It get, makes people stop and think. Okay, it's a good idea. Lots of bars have the entire strip be bars and restaurants. 
but make sure that the owners are aware that it is a family community. We are not Richmond Street. We, we are not the club district. There's a reason that we have a club district for the people that aren't married, don't have kids, can go and party. Because it's in an area where there aren't a lot of people living with kids. This is a residential neighborhood. This is a place where people move to have kids, not to party. How about the bars? How about the bars? How about the clubs? But make sure that they respect their neighbors that were there before they moved in. The people who own it. Don't care. Okay. Yeah. And, and as an aside, um, I work in the bar industry on weekends. I walk up Ossington after all those bars are closed, and over the past year or so, the frequency in which I get asked if I want to buy some crack, or do you want any coke, need some weed, it, it, it's continually gone up. I can't walk up Ossington at 5, 6 in the morning after I get off work without being offered 5 or 6 times. And I didn't used to get that. Those clubs, those bars and clubs are all becoming a feeder and a drug business. Talk to me and Brad. Are your employees from the community? Sure, why not? Are they? Go outside. You want to take it outside, Walter? Because the rest of us want to be here, okay? You can serve against the bar. Hello? You will get the bar. Please do not engage with us, okay?
think the point is going to be directly related to the argument between quiet and noise. Um, I've been here since 2001 at the foot of Washington, and the planning study that some people have mentioned in 2004 came about because the city planners were heavily in favor of a storage facility expansion. And at the root of it, it's not that big a deal because it's a fairly benign use. But it was the planner's attitude towards Ossington that bothered me. It was like anything you can get to happen here is good. Because this street sucks. And I had just bought a building here, and this street didn't suck. It was so prime. And then two or three years later, the residential um, development went up where the old parking lot and car wash and cafe were. And in my view, the city needs a new zoning bylaw where the ground floor of every new building on a commercial strip or a quasi-commercial strip should be 3.6 meters or say 12 feet minimum. And it should be able to be used for commercial or residential use or your work or whatever so that over time, the city, the street can develop into what it will. So, what, what the other part of the point is, is Spadina, this might surprise a few people. Ossington is the only commercial street between Spadina and Roncesvall that goes between Dundas and um, Queen. Bathurst doesn't, Brock doesn't, Dufferin doesn't. It's a bit of a shock. But because of that, Austin really, so what, I guess what I'm saying is the planners have been involved at two points, both times too late. Planning is supposed to be ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. And the city is like a human with blood vessels, etc., and arteries, and the streets are our arteries. And if Austin is broken up, it, it can't, the commercial aspect, it can't succeed in the way if you have a blood clot in your arm. It doesn't work so well. So we need, it'll have growing pains, yes, but we need to promote commercial streets as commercial streets. I lived in Toronto over many, many years. And I wonder what difference is this process going to make to any other that has happened on College, on Bloor, on any of the other streets that where residences step back onto commercial and bar and restaurant uses. What what can we hope for that hasn't happened before? <laughs> what precedent? Let me tell you, people in the Thomas and Mayor Residence Association, the local residence association, they were extremely happy that that study was done there. As certain changes were put in. If you want to, you know, because few changes were put in. And the business community who lived with the changes, and everybody, there's beginning to be a bit of a warfare going on there, too. You know, and now it's settled down for a few years, and then things change again. Did it have so to do with size? The size? It has to do with size. For example, College Street, before, a lot of these commercial strips often have size on the residential street. And, and the more you're on the side, the you access to do what you do, uh, the more likely you are to impact on the residential community. So, if on College Street, restrictions were put in on. Uh, how do you establish them from the site street? Also, restrictions were put in that you can't have a restaurant on the second floor. Because you have a second floor restaurant, you will lose people's back here. You know, restrictions were put in that if you have a garage door you know, on your store, on your restaurant, you can't have a garage door. If you have a garage door and there's music, and, and you have to be near a corner, guess what? The music will travel, you know, in the residential area. So the restrictions, uh, you know, College Street has a 300 square meter maximum you know, for any restaurant. Here it's 400 you know, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see. So these are the kind of changes which are tweaking the system to avoid the bigger, to try to minimize the conflict that is between a resident who wants peace and quiet and complete the quiet. And they want to go home. They want to rest. Right? And the business community, which you want to have fun. I mean, fun means you drink, you get noisy, you have music, and so forth. There's an inherent conflict. And the question is to try to find that balance. And on College Street, for example, in other places, that balance 
there's a better balance now than there was before the self exercise. That's the idea behind it. Will it work?
uh, drugs that we've investigated and are before the court. And ultimately, I mean, it's our goal, whether they're fine, uh, whether they get a prohibition order, is to have them cease the use, even if it means going as far as an injunction, which we're currently doing it against a couple of places in the vicinity. So, how quickly does a cease order, like, once you get a complaint, once you have to be obviously investigated. That's right, re inspected, and if we determine they're still continuing the use, that's when we go back to the court and appeal for a prohibition order or an injunction. And what is that time? Like? Just a general... It, it could take anywhere between six months and two years. And I'll give you a classic example for those of you that can remember. Uh, the Meow Club on the Lakeshore. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Meow Club was a, was a huge entertainment facility, probably the biggest one in its day back in 2004. And it started off as just a bunch of people that lived down in the Swansea neighborhood that started to complain about people defecating on their lawns and cars racing up and down their street. Then it became a noise issue. Then it became how they were operating because they had a, they were a, you know, four or five, uh, four or five hundred square meter restaurant. Really, they were a nightclub. At the end of the day, we got an injunction and we closed them down. It took two years by court order. We actually went there with the police, vacated the premises, boarded up the doors, and changed the locks. If it needs to be done, you can go down that road, but I want you to appreciate it. Does it? And, and that's, so we're talking about a big stretch of time that people are inconvenient, and if one to go to the court, how big of a penalty can be imposed? Like, what can be Well, ultimately, they could be closed down for good shut down, ultimately they can get tens of thousands of dollars in fines if you get to that point. Not suggesting that's what you're going to get the first time up, but it's progressive. If we come back again and say, you know what, a week later or a month later, the same people being disturbed by the same noise, we're now requesting higher fines. The courts see that there's victims and there's, you know, the, the, the penalties increase. Yes, people, one of the things that took place was the gasoline station, auto body shop, car wash that we had at Falcon and Washington. At that time, we had meetings like this because of the concern that they're coming in, and some of the results of those meetings were the fact that we changed the bylaw to eliminate clubs, etc., from coming on Washington Avenue, and several of the other changes that were put into the bylaw. After that was completed, etc., Washington started to die. Then we got karaoke bars that came in. And they were a problem. We had the carpentry shops, etc., at the upper part. They started moving up. Then we started getting a few restaurants coming in and so forth. In the last 20 years, we had Queen Street being developed, etc. As Queen Street got filled up, then we started having some places coming up Austin, like Sweaty Betty's, etc. And as they say, Sweaty Betty only has problems on the weekend when the rains come in. During the rest of the week, it's calm and everything along that line. What we need is some changes that are going to be made as they're coming in now, but we need some control over those uh, those changes. What's to be allowed? That's why I think Joe is trying to bring in this bylaw moratorium, etc., that we can discuss what we want. To some people want big shops. Some people want some other things that should be on the street, as opposed to strictly bars and restaurants, etc. We want to spread out some of the stuff that's coming out. That's why we have only 200 people coming out to try to voice their concerns. We need more meetings, and it can all be done in one week's time. The bylaws have to be looked at. The bylaws have to be discussed. What do we want on the street? But we can't stop the development because otherwise the street will die again. So the people are coming in, some good, some not so good. Some of the places that are coming in, we've got concerns about. Others, we should be inviting them in. One other thing that hasn't been mentioned at all is the fact that because of these places coming in, the assessments are skyrocketing. There's a couple of places on the street, I've got the assessments for the whole street. They've got over a million and a half dollars because of the changes that are happening. That's all affecting what's going on. The residential has also gone in the last 10 years in the year, or 20 years. People have moved in because they want to live down in the city, but they want to be able to control, and the one thing I forgot to mention, 
30 years ago, there was a limit at the time that bars could be open till 1 o'clock. The city started changing this till 2 o'clock, to 3 o'clock, to 4 o'clock. And this is part of the problem. Now, I don't know if we can make any changes to that, but if there was something that we could do and say, bars on Ossington can only be open till a certain time, or something along that. But that's what's got to happen through discussion and through this moratorium. Maybe we can resolve some of those concerns. Which seems to be a part of a problem because just yesterday there was a community meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I live in the same ward, but for example, the ward division goes right in the middle of Doverport, so the community between Doverport and Gladstone is fighting the same cause I hear right now. So, and they are fighting it for four years and has not come very far. That's just like, you know, not to discourage you, but to perhaps take some avenues to organize And they do have a decent deal of residence association. So, in view of all that fight, uh, Great Hall is applying for a 500 people uh, sticker license. So you can imagine that uh, all the patients on Queen Street are going to still um, your Washington too. So the disconnect between the municipal licensing and between the city, uh, you know, body and the planners is huge. When I was at the Ward 18 meeting yesterday, nobody mentioned any of the future plans that are going to happen on the Canada side. Uh, you know, people keep expressing their bakery shop and grocery store, I mean, I appreciate Joe if you elaborate a little bit on what is going to happen in the area. I happen to know because I've been participating in all these community meetings since like 02. And there are huge changes, ha changes happening <coughs> in the triangle, on the cabinet side, and you know, these are just the start of people really having an unnecessary antagonistic relationship with a fat <coughs> restaurant owner. Because, you know, what the Dickensfield community did, the same thing as owner of Sway Bay said, uh, that they great people, start paying attention to the residents, talking to them, and, you know, having the streaming should stop. Okay? Everybody should just, like, you know, assume some cultivated positions and stop just, like, talking <coughs> calmly and nicely. And let's say uh, the place the cross trade to sell put up a sign saying uh, asking the patron to see, you know, low the level of noise after eleven PM. Then what else can be done? And I don't see any representative of the team. Apparently there is a callback unit assigned to the certain area. So when we deal with the vandalism in the area, people have a number to call and report the vandalism and incident right at the minute. So these are factual things that people can actually do. And you as our representative, Mr. Macaroni, can advise us of this little we saw this board in our apartment right on Arlington, and we did that because we felt it's been a really good community. And I'm all for the bars and restaurants. In fact, some of us have even helped each other build each other's bars and restaurants. But when it's come to some of the new ones, and I think this is where we go back to enforcement, I've tried straight up talking to owners very nicely over a bunch of months before they even helped me. I've tried the cops and I've tried the city and all the dead ends. The cops basically just gave up on me and told me that there's no point for the, the, the municipality. I've tried them and they've told me to go back to the cops and that there is no real police for noise. I'm talking things that start at 11 and go till 3. They don't even open in the day. This isn't even a restaurant. I don't even have any food there. So I think the thing is enforcement and we're turning to you to change that because we can't do it ourselves anymore. Clearly it's happening. So. Across the country and across um, the best retail buildings in the city. And something that you'll find is going to happen with this moratorium is that Dundas is going to come alive with new bars and restaurants. Uh, Queen Street will, in areas that are spotty, will suddenly become viable. So, in a way, I think it's, it's 
odd that you've chosen this one little strip because I don't think that's really been the problem. We saw a moratorium come in on King of Sedona, when a few big bars opened up down, downtown. I think this cause of all of the people coming and the people that you don't want to be in this area is because of what the city's done with the moratorium and liquor licenses in the entertainment district. Uh, right now, there are no licenses allowed over 200 square meters from Spadina to Bathurst, north to Queen and south to Front Street. And your area that you've chosen, the specific small <coughs> area, seems like more of a, an act to try and induce more business to come out on the Dundas Street. And what, but that's what will happen. You'll find that the area will be probably Trinity Velvet all the way out to Brock where Lansdowne will become a little more of an appeal for people who can't open the restaurants in the entertainment district. Something that you'll find after your moratorium is lifted, if it is lifted and you come out of control, are the people that you're trying to keep out the most are the ones who will be able to work through the legal system to get in here. They don't have the money with the lawyers, and I've seen it happen on King Street, to be able to work their way in, get around the bylaws, get around the no dancing, get around the no government capture on the clock. They have the ability to do it, and you'll find that that's what you've created. Thank you for the idea. Even though Dundas Street is two short blocks away from Bath to Bay, there was no shit. And College Street is a little bit, but I have to be kind of funny. But it's not hard. But anyway, you know what happened? Thank you. 
Which gives us the blind, not fully